بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ڈیئر سٹوڈنٹس آور ٹوڈے سیشن از آن والیوم ٹو آف دا ناول ایما وی وڈ اسٹارٹ والیوم ٹو ان ٹوڈے سیشن اینڈ وی وڈ لک ایٹ دا ٹیکسٹ اسٹوری اینڈ وی وڈ ڈو کرٹیکل انالیسس آف امپورٹنٹ پارٹس از ویل بفور آئی موو فارورڈ آئی وڈ لائک ٹو شیئر اے کوئک ریویو آف دا پریویس سیشن ویل ان دا پریویس سیشن وی کورڈ چیپٹرز نائن ٹو ایٹین آف والیوم ون important happenings in these chapters, points of discussion and important parts of the text with reference to the development of characters was done. Jane Austen as a writer and her art of characterization was also um, talked about and we looked at the development of different themes through these chapters. We also explored the writing style of Jane Austen. With this we come to today's session. As I have said earlier, in this session we will start volume 2 of the novel Emma. I think it is important to mention that in some available texts the whole novel is presented in 55 chapters, while in some others the same 55 chapters are divided into three volumes. Thus volume 1 has 18 chapters, volume 2 also has 18 chapters, while volume 3 has 19 chapters. Again the total is the same 55 chapters. However, as I have said earlier that uh, there are different types of texts, uh, different versions that are available in the market. So the division that I have followed is of volumes. However, the same sequence of chapter numbers continues from volume 1 to the next volume that is volume 2. Thus chapter 1 of volume 2 is numbered as volume 2 chapter 19 in the presentations. This helps in keeping the sequence from chapter 1 to 55 and also gives the clue which volume it is. So, if you follow chapter number, then follow chapter 1 to 55 to follow chapter numbers. Otherwise, where it is written volume, volume 1, volume 2, you will only know that this is from volume 1, this is from volume 2. Okay, this is from volume 1, this is from volume 2. Or this part is from volume 3. But in chapters, the sequence is the same. In today's session, we will cover first 10 chapters of volume 2. Now, in other words, I would say that we will cover from chapter 19 to chapter 28. And what we would cover with reference to these chapters? Again, we would look at the important happenings, the events that take place in these chapters. Um, some critical points of discussion would be brought uh, into consideration. We would look at selected text with reference to the development of characters. Mm, we would discuss uh, how Jane Austen as a writer masterly uh, depicts her art of uh, characterization. And of course we would see how different themes emerge and how they are sustained through um, these chapters as well. And finally writing style of Jane Austen would also be considered at different points and we would see uh, what is it that um, she uses as a part of her style as a writer. With this we start the first chapter of volume 2 that is uh, chapter 19 in total. During a walk Emma has little success turning Harriet's thought from Mr. Elton and therefore decides that they should call on Mrs. and Miss Bates. As a result of this, Emma and Harriet call upon Mrs. and Miss Bates and Miss Bates speaks continuously just chattering without a purpose. If you remember, I said at the very outset in the very first session on uh, introduction to the novel Emma that the main theme of the novel is human absurdities. So the absurdity that we find in the character of Miss Bates is that she talks too much, she keeps on chattering without a purpose. While Miss Bates talks pointlessly, Emma behaves with exemplary manners. She is a firm believer in following the manners and mannerism that is appropriate for the particular class she belongs to and this is what she exhibits here again. As Miss Bates talks too much, she also talks a lot about Mr. Elton that they are forced to hear. She mentions detail of Mr. Elton's travels as well. Though Emma has tried to time her visit so as to avoid hearing about Miss Bates's niece Jane Fairfax, Miss Bates refers to her as well. 
Emma exhibits proper manners and even asks about Jane Fairfax when Miss Bates mentions her. Miss Bates received a letter from Jane who intends to visit next week and she will be sent by the Campbells who paid for her education. Now Emma's imagination is at work once again. Since the Campbells are about to visit their newly married daughter, Mrs. Dixon in Ireland, which means that uh, Jane will be coming for an extended visit in Highbury in a week's time. Based on very slight evidence, I would say, Emma suspects that there has been a romance between Jane and the Campbell's daughter's husband, that is Mr. Dixon. And that this is the reason that Jane is, uh, Jane, Jane means Jane Fairfax, she is missing the trip to Ireland. Thus again, Emma, out of her habit of matchmaking, begins to suspect that Jane Fairfax might be involved with Mr. Dixon. Again, it is very irrational attitude on the part of Emma. Uh, Miss Bates, uh, as she has received the letter of Miss uh, Fairfax, she reads this letter to um, to Emma. The letter reveals a lot of things. Number one, it reveals how pointlessly and how uh, purposelessly uh, Miss Bates keeps on chattering and she even does not consider that the, the other person is bored. Um, how she loses concentration in her speech as well is very evident from the way she reads the letter out for Emma. Mm, uh, it shows Emma's uh, reactions to the letter as well so let's read the text of the letter. When um, Emma asks, have you heard from Miss Fairfax so lately? I'm extremely ho happy. I hope she is well. Thank you. You are so kind, replied the happily deceived aunt. This is Miss Bates, while eagerly hunting for the letter. Oh, here it is. She finds the letter. I'm sure it could not be far off, but I had put my, ho my housewife upon it, you see, without being aware, and so it was quite hid. But I had it in my hand so very, late, so very lately that I was almost sure it must be on the table. I was reading it to Mrs. Cole and since she went away I was reading it again to my mother. For it is such a player to her, a letter from Jane, that she can never hear it often enough. So I knew it could not be far off. And here it is, only just under my housewife. And since you are so kind as to wish to hear what she says, but first of all, I really must, in justice to Jane, apologize for her writing so short a letter. So what you would have noticed is that she doesn't tell anything from the letter, but she keeps on talking nonsense, she keeps on talking abruptly, without any purpose, pointlessly. There is no coherence in what she says. Anyhow, this uh, story of the letter continues and uh, Miss Bates says, only two pages you see, hardly two. And in general, she fills the whole paper and crosses half. My mother often wonders that I can make it out so well. She often says when the letter is first opened, well, Hetty, now I think you will be put to it to make out all that checker work. Don't you, ma'am? And then I tell her, I'm sure she would contrive to make it out herself if she had nobody to do it for her every word of it. I'm sure she would pour over it till she had made out every word. And indeed, though my mother's eyes are not so good as they were, she can see amazingly well still. Thank God. So what you can notice is that Miss Bates ki kisi baat ka dusi se koi connection nahi hai. She keeps on hovering from one subject to the other, hopping from one topic to the other. Abhi letter ki baat karte karte apni ammi ki baat karna shuru ho jati hai Mrs. Bates ki. Mrs. Bates ki jab baat kar rahi hai toh then she switches over to her eyesight that it is um, still good. Anyhow she says that uh, she can see amazingly well still thank God with the help of spe spectacles. It is such a blessing. My mothers are really very good indeed. Jane often says when she is here I am sure grandma you must have had very strong eyes to see as you do and so much fine work as you have done too. I only wish my eyes may last me as well. So what you can notice is that um, what she speaks is not very much relevant. All this spoken extremely fast obliged Miss Bates to stop for breath and Emma said something very civil about the excellence of Miss Fairfax's handwriting. You are extremely kind, replied Miss Bates, highly gratified. You who are such a judge and write so beautifully yourself, I am sure there is nobody's praise that could give us so much pleasure as Miss Woodhouse's. My mother doesn't hear, she is a little deaf, you know. Ma'am, 
Addressing her, do you hear what Miss Woodhouse is so obliging to say about Jane's handwriting? So you can notice that there is no coherence in what Miss Bates talks about. Well, there are some important discussion points with relation to this chapter. Emma's character further develops. She learns from her mistakes with regard to Harriet Smith. Her experience with reference to Elton has led her to greater self-examination. And what we notice is that for the first time, Emma begins to consider her own faults and wants to improve herself. When she visits the Bates, this is an attempt to correct one of these faults. In fact, she admits that she has been careless towards Mrs. and Miss Bates, who depend, who depend on the compassion of the higher members of Highbury society. What we notice about Emma is that she's quite responsible and she understands her social responsibility. As far as Miss Bates is concerned, she resembles Harriet Smith in a number of respects. Both are limited in wit and imagination. Both belong to the unprivileged class. As far as plot construction is concerned, with her incessant chatter, Miss, Betters, uh, Miss Bates is primarily a comic relief. It is interesting that we do not find any other reason of the pity of Emma for Miss Bates, but that socially she is poor. Harriet Smith, in contrast, is a more rounded character with greater shadings, and we see her develop through the novel. Um, theme of vanity is a very important theme that uh, is reinforced in this chapter. Reference to Jane Fairfax reminds us of Emma's vanity. To satisfy Emma's jealousy towards Jane, she invents the idea that Jane may be involved in some illicit affair with a married man. Well, this chapter is mainly about Jane Fairfax, who is the granddaughter of Mrs. Bates and niece of Miss Bates. When she was three years of age, she became an orphan after her father was killed in battle and her mother died of consumption and grief soon afterwards. We have already been told that she was brought up by the Campbells. However, now we are told that Jane lived with her aunt and grandmother in Highbury until she was eight years old and was taken into care by Campbells later. In fact, Colonel Campbell had served in the army with Jane's late father and the young girl had been well educated on his behalf. Emma is quite unhappy about her visit, although we don't find a solid reason for her dislike of Jane. It is for sure that Emma never liked Jane for reasons she cannot fully explain. Mr. Knightley suggests to her that she is jealous. And because Mr. Knightley is a voice of reason, so we need to see whether he proves to be right at the end or not. Maybe it is jealousy on the grounds that she may not be considered her equal. Anyhow, when Jane visits, Emma is polite to her despite her jealousy and this shows her firm belief in manners and mannerism. Also, Jane's beauty impresses her and she feels compassion for her impeding fate. Meeting with Jane also provides Emma some minor information about Frank Churchill from Jane who has met her there. Uh, three important themes emerge uh, from what happens in this chapter. The theme of jealousy, theme of social status and theme of friendship. Coming towards the first theme that is of jealousy, I would say that Jane, Jane Fairfax is an example of the self-made woman whose high regard in society comes not from her familial connections but from her talents and charm. Except for status, she equals Emma in every respect and it is Emma's competitive nature that causes her to dislike Jane. Assuming negative qualities where none may actually exist, Yet in their respective fates, Emma and Jane Fairfax differ considerably. Because of her lack of fortune, Jane Fairfax must enter a profession as a governess, a condition that requires her to sacrifice all of her players of her life. On the other hand, Emma will retain her life of leisure and luxury under all but the most extreme circumstances. Again, what we notice in terms of the art of characterization is that through a comparison and contrast of Emma and Jane Fairfax, we are provided a lot of information about them. The next theme is that of social status and one of the major functions that Jane Fairfax serves in the novel is as a juxtaposition against the other characters. Although equal to Emma in all regards, she lacks status and social class.
This serves as a reminder that it is not Emma's sharp intelligence or talents that ultimately make her the head of Highbury society, but instead her family and fortune. So much has to do with her, um, her wealth, her social status, not her intelligence. The last theme that we would talk about with reference to chapter 20 is the theme of friendship. Jane's lack of a solid familial standing gives her a similar status to Harriet Smith. Jane Fairfax is poised, talented and refined. It is she who deserves to marry higher in society and to be Emma's closest companion. Yet Emma's inability to be anything else than the center of attention makes this impossible. And actually it is because of Emma's self-centeredness and her fear that Jane, or Jane uh, Fairfax might not be taken as an equal to her that she does not um, only uh, like Jane Fairfax but also she does not allow her to be um, considered as a possibility to be friended with. Jane Austen's art of characterization um, is uh, very much prominent here. This time Jane Austen compares Fairfax and Frank Churchill. There are significant parallels between Jane Fairfax and Frank Churchill. Austen as an author reinforces this uh, comparison when uh, Jane says that she has met Frank. Both are somewhat mysterious visitors connected to Highbury society through familial connections. Both are raised outside of Highbury. Both are raised by more elite families after their mothers had died. And both are born in one social class but have lived in another class. Dear students, this takes us to chapter 21. Mr. Knightley compliments Emma on how well she treated Jane Fairfax when they dined together. As Mr. Knightley tells Emma that he has news for her, Miss Bates and Jane Fairfax interrupt them. Jane Fairfax thanks Emma for the hint quarter of pork that she had sent to her and tells Emma that Mr. Elton is to be married to a Miss Hawkins from Bath. Emma assumes that Mr. Elton's acquaintance with Miss Hawkins must not be very long. Anyhow, they part then, which means Jane Fairfax and Miss Bates who leave. Another happening that might be of interest for you in this chapter is that Harriet comes to Highbury in the rain. She bursts in with news that she has run into Mr. Martin and his sister in town. She relates that after some awkwardness, the pair greeted her with kindness. Though they were polite to each other, Harriet was extremely embarrassed. Why she is embarrassed now? Because uh, it was on the advice of Emma that she had refused Martin's proposal. Emma is very much impressed by the Martins' behavior and reconsiders her judgment of them. This shows a development in the character of Emma. However, the learning of Emma is not yet complete. So she still believes that their social status is too low to consider Martin as a suitable match for Harriet. She does not want Harriet to think much about Martin, so she distracts Harriet from thoughts of that meeting by sharing the news of Mr. Elton's impending marriage. Impending marriage. Emma is also relieved that Harriet has little opportunity for contact with the Martins. We need to look at some important critical points with reference to this chapter. Mr. Knightley is complimenting Emma for treating Jane Fairfax kindly when they dine together is very important. He gives the clues that he knows about Emma's true jealousy towards Fairfax. Yet again, Emma has demonstrated great tact and manners towards a person she dislikes and in the background where she lives this is to be appreciated. In this chapter both of Harriet Smith's prospective suitors return to some prominence in the plot and Harriet feels uncomfortable because of both of them. Mr. Elton's upcoming marriage to Miss Hawkins is a proof of the true reason for his absence from Highbury and in all this context two themes emerge one is of social class and status and the other is of self-deception and snobbery. We would look at these one by one. As far as the theme of social class and status is concerned, um, it confirms that Mr. Knightley had suspected uh, what he had suspected about um, uh, Elton. It was true. He did have a um, 
prospective marriage possibility elsewhere and immediately set upon this prospect once he realized that he could not have Emma. We also remember how he treated Harriet. Martin on the other hand treats her very differently and uh, though he has been rejected by Harriet, the supposedly coerced Martins remain kind and cordial. Honorable where Mr. Elton is cruel and deceptive. Again through the comparison and contrast of Elton and Martin, a lot is brought to the notice of reader by the author. The second theme is of self-deception and snobbery that gathers importance. Emma's self-deception is not completely over yet. St she still has a lot to learn from life. Despite how kind the Martins remain to Harriet Smith, Emma has not moved past her prejudice against them and is relieved that they are unlikely to have much contact with Harriet. She still sticks to the same point that Martin is too low for Harriet to marry. Well, uh, if we look collectively from chapter 19 to 21 in terms of what happens, there is a very crucial point that I would like to discuss and that is about the life of Miss Bates. Miss Bates is an example of the claustrophobia of village life, a very limited, very, very restricted life. What she is in the novel, a comic relief, a pathetic example of low quality life, an example of life with very limited and narrow experiences. This is what I would say as an answer. With a more developed sense of Miss Bates' character, Austin provides some distinctly different views of women's experiences in Highbury. Again, we can compare and contrast her to Emma, who is very sophisticated and very privileged. Again, we can compare the power and the authority that is related to the character of Emma in comparison and contrast with the um, kind of life Miss Bates has. Again, as we read the letter the, or we shared uh, how Miss Bates talked about the letter, we understand Emma's impatience with Miss Bates, but again, um, she handles all that very decently. And Mr. Knightley believes that Emma should treat Miss Bates with great charity and less irritation, though in general he appreciates her patience towards her. Well, there is some autobiographical note um, uh, with reference to these chapters as well. Some critics assert that Miss, that Miss Bates stands for Jane Austen herself. Single, middle-aged, dependent, caring for an elderly mother, Miss Bates' situation in life is much closer to Austen's at the time when she was writing the novel than is Emma's. Of course, Austen is much more intelligent than the character. She creates, so perhaps Miss Bates exemplifies Austen's imagination of what her life would be like without her intellect. The picture is somewhat al alarming because Miss Bates' ignorance means that she's perfectly contented with the life she leads. And the question that arises is that does it mean knowing or to have knowledge and intelligence are a cause of suffering? for a woman like Austen in the early 19th century. Anyhow, with this we move on to chapter 22. Not a week after Miss uh, Augusta Hawkins' uh, name had been mentioned among Highbury, she had already been revealed to be handsome, elegant, accomplished and highly amicable, although Emma notes that she has no truly respectable family connections. Mr. Elton returns to Highbury with renewed spirits as he is to be married shortly. Harriet's spirits worsen upon Mr. Elton's return, although she has now resumed contact with Martin. Emma suggests that Harriet visit the Martins out of considerations for propriety. So even if Emma allows her to visit Martins, it is just as a part of manners, not otherwise. Well, we continue with chapter 22 of uh, this volume and what we find is that Emma suggests that Harriet should visit the Martins out of considerations for propriety uh, when Mr. Martin's sister leaves her a note at Mrs. Goddard's. However, Emma decides that though Harriet should return the visit, she should stay only a brief time in order to reinforce the distance that Emma, despite a twinge of conscience, believes Harriet must maintain from the Martin family. So what we notice is that she still believes in that social class distinction.
So the important themes that emerge out of this chapter are the theme of, as I said, distinction between wealth and status, theme of snobbery and of propriety. We would look at these one by one. Theme of distinction between wealth and status. Well, wealth is the primary motive for Mr. Elton's marriage to Mrs. Hawkins. She has a fortune that she brings to the marriage. So she is wealthy. But certainly not the social status that Emma has. It is here that Austin makes the distinction between wealth and status. Miss Hawkins is certainly wealthy, but the source of this wealth is important. Her family's fortune comes from the somewhat disreputable trade industry, not from the ownership of property, which is the source of the income for the Woodhouses and Mr. Knightley. Now what you can do is you can look at all this uh, in comparison to the Pakistani context. Chaudhri hona, jagirdar hona, to belong to the upper class in the rural areas is uh, more important. It has something more to do with your status and less to do with money. Kisi aur ke paas bhi paise ho sakte hain, but then to have that um, kind of family name and the ownership of land with which this uh, family name is associated is more uh, important and it is considered to be of more privilege. And same is the case with uh, Emma and the background in which she is living. As far as the theme of snobbery is um, concerned, um, theme of snobbery recurred through Emma's behavior and action. Um, she is not ready to consider Jane Fairfax of equal importance. Um, her rejection of Mr. Elton is, of course, again, a um, um, reflection of her snobbery. As far as the theme of propriety is concerned, I would say that Emma emphasizes proper manners, so she wants Harriet to pay a visit to Martins. This takes us to chapter 23, and what we see is that Emma takes Harriet's, Harriet to visit the Martins. They pre-decide that Emma would leave uh, her there and then would return and retrieve Harriet after 15 minutes. Harriet has a very friendly and emotional visit with Mr. Martin's mother and sister, but when Emma comes to pick her, Martin's understand what has happened. Emma is conscious of it, but she still believes she is doing what is best for Harriet. Again, this is her self-deception. Fatigued by the business of Harriet, the Martins and Mr. Elton, Emma visits the Westerns because she wants to relax. Her spirits are revived by this meeting with Mr. and Mrs. Westerns because uh, um, Mrs. Weston, that is Miss Taylor previously, she um, is very close to her heart. And now Mr. and Mrs. Weston bring the news that Frank Churchill's arrival is imminent. The following day, Emma unexpectedly meets Frank Churchill at Halffield. She is happy to meet Frank Churchill. He is a very good looking man and Emma immediately likes him for he is quite charming and well spoken. Emma, Mr. Woodhouse and the Westerns socialize with Frank Churchill and Emma is pleased by the beginning of this acquaintance. Emma is also pleased to find that Frank has just the right compliment for everyone, especially Mrs. Weston, which pleases Emma. It is important that Emma can see that Mr. Weston hopes that she and Frank might form an attachment and she wonders if thought has occurred to Frank or not. Now that she has started considering that Frank can be the most suitable suitor for her, um, when his father departs on an errand, Frank leaves to call on his acquaintance for Weymouth Jane Fairfax, which of course Emma would not like. Some uh, critical points of discussion with reference to this chapter are as follows. Frank Churchill's final arrival at Highbury that was much awaited reveals little substantial information about the young man who still remains a mystery. More significant is that despite this lack of any more tangible information, Emma is quite pleased with Frank. She has assumed him to be a good and a very nice person. She knows that she will like Frank at first sight when he has had no opportunity to exhibit any personal qualities positive or negative and she takes every minor shading to his personality as an example of his excellence. Again this is the illusionment of Emma. The question arises is whether it is the status of Frank Churchill that uh, leads Emma to think this uh, 
uh, in this positive way about him or it is something else. Well, in terms of plot development, we cannot say anything about the connection of Jane Fairfax and Frank Churchill uh, at this time point, but later on uh, we would come to know about them. However, Austin as a writer keeps on foreshadowing for later developments between the two characters. So here we have chapter 24. As far as chapter 24 is concerned, we see that Frank Churchill and Mrs. Weston visit Emma. Emma is pleased by Frank's warmth towards his stepmother. He seems genuinely interested in everything about Highbury as the three walk about the village, especially in the sites that are meaningful to his father. When visiting the Crown Inn and seeing its ballroom, Frank suggests to Emma that she, with her resources, should hold dances there. They also discuss Jane Fairfax, and Frank says that he finds her unattractive and reserved. He thinks, however, that she is a talented musician and affirms that they saw a good deal of, deal of each other in Weymouth. Surprisingly, Frank disparages Jane Fairfax to Emma, who defends her. While they shop for gloves at Ford's, Frank tells Emma more about Jane Fairfax and how she is destined to be a teacher. He even mentions Mr. Dixon. Emma shares a theory about Jane and Mr. Dixon that they are involved in some kind of uh, illicit relationship, which Frank seems to resist, but he tells Emma more about Jane Fairfax. Emma is pleased to see Frank to be more moderate and warmer than she expected and less a spoiled child of fortune and wealth. She believes that he possesses his father's warmth and sociability and is free from the proud airs one like him might acquire from the Churchills. Again, all this positive view or the positive lens through which Emma looks at um, uh, uh, Frank's character is quite um, questionable in the sense that we really don't know whether he is like that or it is the prejudiced opinion of Emma about him. Talking about important uh, character traits of Frank Churchill, I would say that he is more complicated than Emma originally imagined. He is more sophisticated. He is more interested in his family and Highbury society. We also find that he is more intelligent and engaging. He is more warm and more pleasant. However, all this that is told to us about Frank Churchill's character, it comes from Emma. So the question is whether it is Emma's perspective or reality. Frank, Frank's attitude towards Emma also seems to echo Mr. Elton's earlier manipulation of Emma. Frank Churchill flatters her vanity but in a more subtle way by disparaging the one person for whom Emma holds any jealousy, which means he keeps on making references of degradation to Jane Fairfax. Also, Frank Churchill's comments seem to presume a knowledge of Jane Fairfax that goes beyond mild acquaintance, though he has claimed that it is mild acquaintance. Earlier comments connecting the two indicated that they had met each other only briefly, but Frank Churchill knows a considerable deal about Jane Fairfax, even the gossip about Mr. Dixon. This foreshadows later developments. What does Frank know about Jane Fairfax and how does he know it? These are the questions that are yet to be answered in the upcoming chapters. Well, overall looking at chapter 22 to 24, um, important critical discussion points uh, include that as Emma had predicted in her argument with Mr. Knightley, Frank has a talent for guessing which line of conversation and compliment will please each person. And Frank tailors his behavior accordingly. He keeps on changing his behavior accordingly. He tries to uh, flatter everybody. Remembering Mr. Knightley's initial distaste for Frank's demeanor, demeanor we, found, we wonder if Frank's um, talent at compliments is altogether as admirable as it seems. Again, we need to notice whether it is just Emma's... Uh, Mm, positive lens through which he looks at uh, Frank Churchill or actually he has good qualities. 
Though Emma may be skeptical of Frank's remarks, she gives him the benefit of the doubt because she believes he has a kind nature and is impressed by his speech. Again, it is only Emma's imagination. It is only that whatsoever she thinks is right, she believes in that strongly. That um, despite the doubts she has about Frank's remarks, she gives him the benefit of doubt. She also recognizes that Frank's compliments to Mr. and Mrs. Weston are exaggerated, but Emma believes they express genuine gratitude and affection and forgives his exaggeration because it stems from his honorable desire to please. Again, what we notice is that this is Emma's very subjective view about Frank Churchill. When Frank claims that he has always longed to come to Highbury, Emma wonders why he has not come sooner, but she dismisses her skepticism by concluding, if it were a falsehood, it was a pleasant one and pleasantly handled. She is ready to forgive him for all the exaggerations, the flattering comments, or whatsoever he says. Well, this chapter creates a lot of confusion about uh, Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax and it added to the curiosity of the reader. Frank's inconsistent attitude towards Jane Fairfax is the most confusing part of his behavior. An alert reader will suspect that something unusual has passed between Frank and Jane, but it is only on a second reading that we recognize Frank's behavior as a complicated mixture of honesty and outright deception, vulnerability and manipulation. At this point, he's a good enough liar to fool Emma. At first, Frank seems in a rush to visit Jane, but then he is surprisingly willing to postpone the visit. He is unexpectedly firm in refusing the assistance of Mr. Woodhouse's servant in finding her house, and his insistence on Jane's unattractiveness is uncharacteristically rude. He attempts to avoid Emma's question about his relationship to Jane by ducking into a store, but then he himself returns to the subject. So the duality with which he deals with the subject of uh, Jane Fairfax, um, the confusion that is reflected through his conversations and his actions, all this generates curiosity in the reader about uh, what kind of relationship, if any, they have between them, that is Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax. This also throws light on um, the art of characterization and the ability to develop plot in, um, in an intriguing and a very nice way by Jane Austen. Well, um, to throw some light on the character of Jane Fairfax, I think it is appropriate to have some text from chapter 24. Now this is Emma who is talking to Frank Churchill about Fairfax. And what she uh, asks uh, Frank Churchill about Fairfax goes as following. And how did you think Miss Fairfax looking? Ill, very ill. That is, if a young lady can ever be allowed to look ill. But the expression is hardly admissible. Mrs. Weston, is it? Ladies can never look ill. And seriously, Miss Fairfax is naturally so pale as almost always to give the appearance of ill health. A most deplorable want of complexion. Emma would not agree to this and began a warm defense of Miss Fairfax's complexion. It was certainly no, never brilliant, but she would not allow it to have a sickly hue in general. And there was a softness and delicacy in her skin which gave peculiar elegance to the character of her face. He listened with all due deference, acknowledged that he had heard many people say the same, but yet he must confess that to him nothing could make amends for the want of fine glow of health. Where features were indifferent, a fine complexion gave beauty to them all, and when they, where they were good, the effect was, fortunately, he need not attempt to describe what the effect was. So what we notice is that he is um, talking against Jane Fairfax as he talks to Emma. So the text continues on this slide as well. Fortunately, he needed not attempt to describe what the effect was. Well, said Emma, there is no disputing about taste. At least you admire her except her complexion. He shook his head and laughed. I can't separate Miss Fairfax and her complexion. So what we notice about him is that um, whatsoever he says about Jane Fairfax is against her. Her uh, 
appearance is disliked by him her complexion is um, commented critically by him and um, he does not give any positive comment about fairfax this is some more text did he ever hear the young lady we were speaking of play said frank churchill ever hear her repeated emma you forget how much she belongs to highbury i have heard her every year of our lives since we both began she plays charmingly you think so do you i wanted the opinion of someone who could really judge she appeared to me to play well that is with considerable taste but i know nothing of the matter myself i am excessively fond of music but without the smallest skill or right of judging of anybody's performance i've been used to hear hers admired and i remember one proof of her being thought to play well a man a very musical man and in love with another woman engaged to her on the point of marriage would yet never ask that other woman to sit down to the instrument if the lady in question could sit down instead never seemed to like to hear one if he could hear the other that i thought in a man of known musical talent was same some proof proof indeed said emma highly amused mr dickson is very musical is he we shall know more about them all in half an hour from you than miss fairfax would have uh, watched saved in half a year yes mr dickson and miss campbell were, were the persons and i thought it a very strong proof certainly very strong it was to own the truth a great deal stronger than if i had been miss campbell would have been at all agreeable to me i could not excuse a man's having more music than love more ear than i a more acute sensibility to find sounds than to my feelings how did miss campbell appear to like it it was her very particular friend you know poor comfort said emma laughing one would rather have a stranger preferred than one's very particular friend with a stranger it might not recur again but the misery of having a very particular friend always at hand to do everything better than one does oneself poor mrs dickson well i am glad she is gone to settle in ireland you are right it was not very flattering to miss campbell but she really did not seem to feel it so much the better or so much the worse i do not know which but be it sweetness or be it stupidity in her quickness of friendship or dullness of feeling there was one person i think who must have felt it miss fairfax herself she must have felt the improper and dangerous distinction as to that i do not oh do not imagine that i expect an account of miss fairfax's sensations from you or from anybody else they are known to no human being i guess but herself but if she continued to play whenever she was asked by mr dickson one may guess what one chooses so all the long discussion and argument uh, that emma and um, frank churchill have about jane fairfax it shows how emma is amused by what frank churchill says about jane fairfax and how churchill is making fun of uh, jane fairfax throughout this conversation a small part of the text that continues there appeared such a perfectly good understanding among them all he began rather quickly but checking himself added however it is impossible for me to say on what terms they really were how it might be all be behind the scenes i can only say that there was smoothness outwardly but you who have known miss fairfax from a child must be a better judge of her character and of how she is likely to conduct herself in critical situations than i can be so what we notice is that frank churchill very cleverly and very cunningly um provokes emma to give comments in a negative way about miss fairfax and um he drops hints about fairfax but then he checks himself and then you see um he restrains himself from saying something um that would be later on um, quoted otherwise and uh, anyhow they keep on discussing jane fairfax between them chapter 25 
Emma's good opinion of Frank Churchill is shaken when she hears that he has gone to London simply to get a haircut. Uh, at the very outset of this chapter, actually later on we would read some text of this chapter about Frank Churchill. Um, you would notice um, how Emma is disappointed with what Frank Churchill does in terms of his trip to London for his haircut. The Coles, a family of low origin involved in trade, invite the better families of Highbury or the higher families of Highbury to dine with them. Emma thinks that this is an affront to her high place in society. She should decide her social circle and not have it decided for her by anybody else, such as by the Coles. However, when everyone accepts the Woodhouses uh, receives an invitation to a dinner party at the Coles' home, Emma also feels left out. And when an invitation arrives, she decides to accept it. Let's see what happens in terms of um, the text. At the very outset of the text, we are told, Emma's very good opinion of Frank Churchill was a little shaken the following day by hearing that he was gone off to London merely to have his hair cut. A sudden freak seemed to have seized him at breakfast and he had sent for a chaise and sent off intending to return to dinner but with no more important view that apprehend than having his hair cut. There was certainly no harm in his travelling 16 miles twice over on such an errand, but there was an air of foppery and nonsense in it which she could not approve. Again, Jane Austen as a third person and as an omnipresent, omniscient writer is expressing the feelings or the reaction of Emma towards uh, this action of Frank Churchill. It did not accord with the rationality of plan, the moderation in expense, or even the unselfish warmth of heart which she had believed herself to discern in him yesterday. Vanity, extravagance, love of change, restlessness of temper, which must be doing something good or bad, heedlessness as to the player of his father and Mrs. Weston, indifferent as to how his conduct might appear in general, he became liable to all these charges. Now Emma's view, her perspective about this person, Frank Churchill, is changing. His father only called him a coxcomb and thought in a very good story, thought it a very good story, but that Mrs. Weston did not like it was clear enough by her passing it over as quickly as possible and making no other comment than that all young people would have their little whims. So it's very clear that uh, Mrs. Weston um, doesn't like what Frank Churchill has done though the father is um, just kind of avoiding it. There are some important discussion points with reference to chapter 25. Uh, number one is the theme of self-deception. Frank Churchill's trip to London for a haircut reveals a suspicious arrogance. In the 19th century England, traveling is not that easy, yet a visit to London for a mere haircut is of course a waste of time and resources. However, when it comes to Emma's reaction, she thinks only slightly less of him for it. In fact, she has made up her mind that she would like him and perhaps marry him far before she actually met him. And vain, indulgent actions such as this are ignored by Emma. This self-deception on the part of Emma is nothing new. We found it even in the case of Mr. Elton. Even then she ignored Mr. Elton's fault until it was too late. However, in this situation, it is Emma herself, not Harriet Smith, who risks humiliation and heartbreak. Austin, however, gives a more negative appraisal, noting that his actions show vanity, extravagance, love of change, restlessness of temper. Another important theme that emerges is of social class status and distinction. Actually, uh, the invitation that is given by the Coles is a true representation of that time's England and the reaction to it by Emma is again very representative of the England of those times. The concept of true upper class and the emerging new class is the reason of all this reaction. The Coles party indicates how social life in Highbury is stratified. The Cole family may be wealthy, but they are involved in trade and thus should not presume to set the terms under which they interact with the higher members of their society, that is the Woodhouses, Mr. Knightley, the Westons, etc.
manners and propriety with relevance to different classes of society is another important theme that emerges again and we find that Emma feels that she is to decide where she would go and uh, uh, where she is to be invited it is not for people to decide this class deviant demand, demands from the coals that in contrast they should know that they cannot presume to set social functions for their superiors and must wait for the Woodhouses, Westons and Mr. Knightley to reach out to them. This appropriacy of manners with reference to class and uh, the true concept of uh, um, real upper class is something very important with reference to this novel. So I have selected this part of the text that is about the coals. Let's read the text. This was the occurrence. The Coles had been settled some years in Highbury and were very good sort of people, friendly, liberal and unpretending, but on the other hand they were of low origin, in trade and only moderately genteel. On their first coming into the country, they had lived in proportion to their income, quietly keeping little company and that little unexpensively. But the last year or two had brought them a considerable increase of means. The house in town had yielded greater profits and fortune in general had smiled on them. With their wealth, their views increased, their want of a larger house, their inclination for more company. They added to their house, to their number of servants, to their expenses of every sort and by this time were in fortune and style of living second only to the family at Harfield. Their love of society and their new dining room prepared everybody for their keeping dinner company and a few parties chiefly among the single men had already taken place. The regular and best families Emma could hardly suppose they would presume to invite neither Donwell nor Harfield nor Randalls. Nothing should temper her to go if they did. And she regretted that her father's known habits would be giving her refusal less meaning than she could wish. The Coles were very respectable in their way, but they ought to be taught that it was not for them to arrange the terms on which the superior families would visit them. This lesson she very much feared they would receive only from herself. She had little hope of Mr. Knightley, none of Mr. Western. So basically what Emma wants to do is to teach the Coles that they are from the lower class and they are not of the real upper class and they cannot decide the terms and conditions of uh, socializing with Emma and with other respectable families. This leads us to chapter 26, volume 2. What we find is that Frank Churchill returns from London, unashamed of what he had done. When Emma reaches the Coles party, she finds that Mr. Knightley has already reached there. Because Mr. Knightley usually walks, Emma is surprised that he has come in his carriage. At dinner, Mrs. Cole tells how Jane Fairfax received a new piano from an unknown source. People assume that, in this, that it is this mysterious gift from Colonel Campbell, but Emma tells Frank she suspects that this is a gift from Mr. Dixon. When Jane arrives later, she blushes when questioned about the piano, which further raises suspicions as to who has sent it. Meanwhile, Mrs. Weston tells Emma that Mr. Knightley brought his carriage that he could convey Jane home. Mrs. Weston suggests that a match may be forming between Jane and Mr. Knightley, but Emma resists this supposition vigorously, explaining that she cannot bear the thought of Mr. Knightley marrying because they, then her nephew, George and Isabella's son Henry, will not be able to inherit Donwell Abbey, the Knightley estate in the town of the same name. Mrs. Weston suspects that Mr. Knightley is the one who sent Jane the, the piano forte. As Frank and Emma talk, he suggests to Emma that Mr. Dixon has fallen in love with her and that is why she chose to come to Highbury instead of accompanying the Campbells to Ireland. He also tells how Mr. Dixon saved Jane Fairfax's life when she nearly fell overboard during a water party. The events and happenings mentioned in chapter 26 continue on this slide as well. Frank mentions that Mr. Knightley must have provided a carriage to transport Jane Fairfax and Miss Bates to the party. Emma wonders if this indicates Mr. Knightley's partiality for Jane and becomes upset when she considers that he might marry her.
Emma and Jane sing and play the piano at the party. Frank accompanies them. When Frank persuades Jane to sing one more song after her voice has begun to grow hoarse, Mr. Knightley intervenes. Emma is curious about the origin of the gift, so he, she asks Mr. Knightley about the carriage and piano. He, his answer convinces her that he did not send the gift, but she is still unsure whether he has feelings for Jane or not. It is very important here to notice that why she is being jealous of Jane and why she is being upset with the idea that if uh, Mr. Knightley decides to marry Jane. It is interesting to notice that she is relieved that he does not ask Jane to dance in the party. Emma is also pleased that Frank immediately asks her and not Jane for a dance. This is time for only two dances and um, then the party is to be over. Before the party ends, they only have these two dances, which results that Frank comments to Emma that he's lucky the dancing had to end. Otherwise, he would have found himself asking Jane Fairfax for a dance. Again, what we notice is he is degrading Jane Fairfax. Important uh, discussion points with relation to this chapter are number one, related to Frank Churchill's character and number two, theme of relationships, who is interested in whom. As far as the character of Frank Churchill is concerned, um, mm, there are certain things that we need to notice. His etiquette, his response to people's reaction on his haircut episode, his foolishness, his need for attention. And I would also add his um, comments about Jane Fairfax. Still we are confused about the character of Frank Churchill and we don't, do not know the reality. Theme of relationships, who is interested in whom? Well, when we talk of that, Frank and Emma, Frank and Jane Fairfax, Mr. Knightley and Fairfax. These are the three possibilities of possible matchmaking and we still are not clear who is really interested in whom. One thing that is clear through this chapter is the theme of jealousy. Emma is jealous of um, Fairfax, Jane Fairfax and we don't know why. Why she fears that Mr. Knightley may not marry Jane Fairfax is another question. Jane Austen uses jealousy as a primary motivation for her character's actions and realizations. Emma shows an inclination towards Mr. Knightley for the first time when she believes that he might marry Jane Fairfax. Her argument is that he must remain single so that her nephew will inherit Donville Abbey, but her intense feelings on the matter suggest that she might have other motivations, and this is just a cover. In turn, Mr. Knightley appears quite jealous of Frank Churchill for his attentions to Emma. He is preoccupied with Frank Churchill's vanity and self-absorption and points out these qualities to Emma at every opportunity. If we can recall, even before Frank Churchill came, we noticed Mr. Knightley quite irrationally, surprisingly irrationally, talking against Frank Churchill. This brings us to chapter 27. We find that Emma enjoyed the evening at the Coles, but she is uncertain about the appropriateness of telling Frank about her suspicions that she had about Jane. She also wonders whether she should acknowledge to him the superiority of Jane's musical abilities or not. At the Coles party, Harriet heard that Ma Mr. Martin had dined with the Cox family and there is a rumor that a Cox daughter would like to marry Mr. Martin. Mm, of course, this upsets uh, Harriet. Emma is again at her toes to safeguard Harriet. She doesn't want Harriet to be involved with, Ma with Mr. Martin anyways. To distract and protect Harriet, Emma accompanies her on a shopping trip. Then they decide to pay a visit to the Bates family. They meet Frank and Mrs. Weston on their way as they are going to Bates um, family. The visit, the visit seems to have been Frank's idea, but he offers to stay with Emma and sends Mrs. Weston to make the visit on her own. Emma sends him along, knowing that he will later come see her at Halffield. While Emma and Half uh, Harriet continue to shop, Miss Bates invites them to hear Jane Fairfax play at her new piano. She also tells that Mr. Knightley has sent his last apples of the season to Jane, who is particularly fond of them. Of course, it again gives uh, rise to suspicions in the heart of Emma regarding Mr. Knightley's interest in Jane Fairfax.
This further reinforces the theme of jealousy. Earlier we noticed that jealousy over Jane Fairfax and Frank Churchill respectively seem to motivate romantic feelings in Emma and Mr. Knightley. Now we find the same in the case of Harriet Smith. Her su suspicions about Anne Cox cause worry over uh, Robert Martin's issue and whether or not she made the right decision regarding rejecting him. Another important thing regarding um, this chapter is the confusion related to Frank Churchill. Frank Churchill is deliberately ambiguous towards Emma when she meets him on his way. He is not sure whether to shop with Emma or to visit the Bates family. Finally, he chooses to go with his stepmother to Mrs. Bates' home. His words show that he wants to spend time with Emma, but his actions show that he prefers to visit Mrs. Bates. Since Jane Fairfax is staying with Mrs. Bates, this decision of course proves an obvious choice between the two. This brings us to the last uh, chapter of today's session and uh, that is chapter 28. As Emma reaches the Bates place and enters the sitting room, she finds Frank Churchill occupied with fixing Mrs. Bates glasses and Jane Fairfax seated at the piano. Frank asks Jane questions about how she imagines the piano came to her and his comment, true affection only could have prompted it makes Jane blush. Emma thinks that Frank is teasing Jane unkindly about Mr. Dixon so she asks him to stop doing so. Again she realizes that she should not have shared her thoughts about Jane with him. However still she is confused about all this. Mr. Knightley stops by the Bates to check on Jane's health while Emma and Frank are also there. But because of the numerous visitors he promises to call another time and leaves. Miss Bates thanks Mr. Knightley for sending them his store of apples. With reference to this chapter, what is important as a discussion point is Jane Austen's art as a writer. Jane Austen as a clever writer is deliberately ambiguous about Jane Fairfax's courtship possibilities. This keeps the interest of the reader. We find at the Bates home, Jane Fairfax is the obvious center of attention for all. Of course, this leads to jealousy in Emma as well. When Emma comes, Frank Churchill is helping her fix her new piano so that she may play. Mr. Knightley also visits to ask about her health. This creates a triangle of Jane Fairfax, Mr. Knightley and Frank Churchill and the reader is curious to see how romantic relationships are established further. At this note, I close today's session. These are the materials that are used and incorporated and before I close, I would just have a quick review of the session. Well, in this session we started volume 2 of the novel Emma. Scheme of presentation was introduced and I told that it is important uh, to know that there are different varieties of text that are available in the market. While some have 55 chapters presented, the others have same 55 chapters divided into three volumes. Thus, volume 1 has 18 chapters, volume 2 also has 18 chapters, while volume 3 has 19 chapters. I also shared that I have followed the division of volumes uh, and I would be continually referring to volume 1, 2 and 3. However, as far as the sequencing of chapters is concerned, from volume 1 to 3, continually 1 to 55 chapter numbers are used to number the slides. This helps in keeping the sequence from chapter 1 to 55 and also gives the clue which volume it is. In today's session, we covered first uh, 10 chapters of volume 2, that is from chapter 19 to chapter 28. We looked at the important happenings taking place in these chapters, the important events that took place. We had some important crucial points of critical discussion. Important extracts of text with reference to the development of characters were analyzed. I also talked about Jane Austen as a writer and her art of characterization. Finally, we also looked at different themes as they emerged through the happenings of these uh, uh, events in these chapters. I also gave some, some comments regarding the writing style of Jane Austen. In the next session, we would continue this volume. With this, I end today's session. Thank you very much.